Okay, hello everybody. My name is uh, Angelos uh, Haniotis. I'm professor of ancient history and classics in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, on behalf of both the Institute and Gorgias Press, I welcome you to uh, this uh, talk. Uh, our speaker is Hila Aluf Aboudi, uh, who did her PhD in Hebrew and Judaic studies at the uh, New York University. She is currently in uh, Jerusalem, where she offers lectures uh, on a gap year program called uh, Eshel, uh, and she teaches on wisdom and Jewish philosophy. Uh, she is an independent scholar uh, working on Second Temple literature, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and rabbinic texts. And today, her talk is uh, on um, uh, the subject through the prism of wisdom, Elijah the prophet as a bearer of wisdom in rabbinic literature. And as it always happens in these uh, talks, her book is uh, offered um, at a 40% um, uh, discount uh, on the annual sale of Gorgias Press. So, um, Hela, you have uh, the, fl the uh, floor is yours uh, to present uh, your research. Thank you. I'm just, uh, thank you so much. It's really um, an honor to be here and to share uh, some small snippets, synopsis of my work that hopefully will pique the interest um, of all those who are interested in the study of, of wisdom literature. Um, and uh, it deals with both wisdom in, I try to show the connection between the wisdom in the biblical period into the second temple, um, and then how it streams into rabbinic literature um, in the way that it develops and evolves. Um, so thank you so much for, for hosting this talk um, and um, all those who you know, part in making this happen. So I appreciate it very much. Um, so just the overall main premise um, of, of my work is studying um, Elijah the prophet and all the traditions in rabbinic literature that talk about um, Elijah and seeing how Elijah served as a conduit of wisdom in rabbinic literature. Um, his unique portrayal in the rabbinic material, although at times can seem disjointed, is actually connected through the thread of, wis of the wisdom tradition, which is something that I noticed when I looked at all those traditions, and there's many of them, um, as a whole. The Elijah traditions serve as an expression of the influence of the wisdom tradition on rabbinic thought. And one of the avenues through which this wisdom tradition was incorporated into the rabbinic material was through pietistic rabbis, uh, pietists called Hasidim in, in Hebrew, uh, would say in some ways equivalent to the holy man uh, of late antiquities. And they were very much influenced by the wisdom tradition. And Elijah was viewed as the mediator uh, of wisdom in all its different facets. Um, so that's what I try to show in my work. Um, it's, it's There's a lot that it covers, so I don't know if I'll be able to cover all the different um, parts of it, but hopefully we'll get enough of a taste to, for people to want to delve in a little bit deeper into the sources. Um, part of what I show is really to the preponderance of evidence, the, the, the many sources that continuously will point to uh, the wisdom elements within the text really show you know, this connection. So it's not just that there's one or two or three sources, there's many, many, many of them. I try to analyze a significant amount in the work. And here, I'm gonna try and really let the sources speak for themselves and we'll look at different sources um, that cover the different facets of Elijah's character in rabbinic material and also that show the different facets of wisdom that appear in the rabbinic material. So I'm gonna explain a little bit in detail what exactly that means. Um, so why was I interested in the study of Elijah? How did I even come to this, to this topic? Um, when I was studying, you know, in the biblical story of Elijah in one of two kings, he's obviously an incredibly fascinating figure, um, a miracle worker, not just a prophet, his zealousness for God, 
um, a lot of aspects of his character is quite unique. And so um, that led me to look into, you know, the, the second temple material and then later the rabbinic material. And what we see in the rabbinic material is that Elijah has one of the most uh, variegated nature of biblical characters and their development than many other characters, as far as I know. Um, so there's three different aspects of Elijah's character um, that we see. The first is uh, the commentary on Elijah as a biblical figure um, in Historian 1 and 2 Kings. So anything that describes his role as a prophet um, is mentioned in the rabbinic material. The second uh, facet of Elijah's character is his role in the messianic era. Um, there's a verse in the end of uh, the book of Malachi, one of the last prophetic books, where it states that Elijah shall come um, in the awesome day of the Lord, and he will return the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to their fathers. And that basically ushers in Elijah's role in the Messianic era and all the traditions develop out um, from that um, prophetic message. So um, in the rabbinic material, the role of Elijah in the Messianic era is expanded upon. So not only is Elijah discussed as a biblical character, he's also, his role is discussed as a, a important figure in the Messianic era. And the third facet of Elijah is his role in rabbinic legends, which also is very unique, where he physically appears or an apparition of him or whatever this means, he appears to rabbinic figures, teaches them, talks to them, and saves them from peril. He does all these very interesting things that we don't really see any other biblical figure really reappearing um, in, in rabbinic legends in the same kind of way. Um, so Elijah in that sense was quite fascinating and because his figure was doing so many different things um, in rabbinic literature, most scholars would compartmentalize these different, you know, developments of Elijah and not really connect them together. Um, but as I was studying them, I noticed that they actually did have some connection, maybe not every single um, tradition, but many of them were connected to this idea of wisdom. Um, so just for example, um, this is one of the sources that when I um, was studying them really just shot out to me as being connected to the wisdom tradition. So this tradition is found in um, the Babylonian Talmud, Bavli Berachot 29b where Elijah is seen to be giving advice to Rav Judah. This is an Amoraic um, rabbinic figure. And he's described as Rav Judah, the brother of Rav Salah, the pious. So also there is some connection to um, the, the idea of the Hasidim, which are the, the pious ones. Um, and that also plays a very important figure in a very important part in how these wisdom ideas were incorporated into the rabbinic material. So um, the Hebrew states, Amar le'eliyahu Rav Yehuda, uh, said Elijah to Rav Judah, Achva de Rav Salah Hasida, the brother of Rav Salah the pious, lo tertach velo tachti, lo tarve velo tachti, v'kshata yotze la derech, himlech bekoncha v'tze. So it's advice, life advice. Fall not onto a passion like anger, and that will not sin. Drink not to excess, and that will not sin. And when that goes forth on a journey, seek counsel of thy maker and go forth. So um, anyone who's familiar with the wisdom tradition and the proverbial sayings, the life advice, this just shouts out, you know, to me, to be connected to that idea. So this was an example of saying, I'm, I'm curious if the other Elijah traditions are also connected to wisdom. Um, but before I could really explore that, I needed to delve deep into what is the wisdom tradition and what am I looking for exactly? And that I ended up realizing was quite a complex <laughs> question. Um, and um, 
the development of wisdom as a genre and the influence of uh, modern genre theory on the wisdom tradition and, and literature um, has gone through a significant development in the last 10, 15 years. So first I'll start with the traditional definition of wisdom. Um, Crenshaw is basically is like the father of biblical wisdom. Um, and as a scholar of biblical wisdom, he basically, I would say was more of the minimalist in the what is included in wisdom literature. And he describes wisdom in general as the reason search for specific ways to ensure personal well-being in everyday life, to make sense of extreme adversity and vexing anomalies, and to transmit this hard-earned knowledge so that successive generations will embody it. And I think in our in the source that we just read, we see how you know personal well-being in everyday life is definitely something that Elijah was saying: don't get angry, don't drink too much, you know, and before you go out on a, on a journey, you know. Talk to God a little bit, make sure you're going to be good on, on your journey. So he said the search for meaning in life is also reflected in three levels. Nature, wisdom, meaning looking at the world and observing um, what wisdom you can pick up from the world around us. Uh, judicial or practical wisdom, the day-to-day, -day, life advice, and theological wisdom, um, which is, you know, the, the bigger questions about, you know, the odyssey. God's role in this world, reward and punishment, things like that. Uh, Crenshaw limits wisdom literature to texts that have a specific form. And this is where genre, modern genre theory will push back on Crenshaw. And he says that the wisdom form was specifically um, proverbial sentences or instruction, debate or intellectual reflection. Um, and that anything that fell outside that category for example, if it was a narrative form or psalms, prayers, even if it had wisdom elements or themes, he would not consider that a wisdom literature, but rather something that was influenced by wisdom. Um, but um, modern genre theory um, basically defined genre as being more like a type and less of a class in regard to its classification. Um, and Alistair Fowler is the one who was a big proponent of the dynamic nature of genre. And he states, when we assign a work to a generic type, we do not suppose that all its characteristic traits need to be shared by every other embodiment of the type. Um, so um, in, in the sense that like, if, if all wisdom literature doesn't have to share all the same things in order for them to be considered both wisdom but rather they have to have, let's say, a certain number of important elements or core elements and then can branch out and develop and the, the genre itself can transform to include other types of forms. Um, so in this way, a literary genre changes with time so that its boundaries cannot be defined by any single set of characteristics such as would determine a class. Um, so, I obviously um, go into depth in, in understanding this concept within the work, but I think hopefully for now this should be sufficient. And the impact that modern genre theory had on wisdom literature is the movement away from pigeonholing wisdom into one form and allowing for its usage and influence on different biblical works such as Psalms, Ezekiel, Daniel, Job, for example. Um, so it allows for a greater understanding of the convergence of different genres and modes of thought um, that we'll see in Second Temple literature really expands, um, where we'll see a lot of different genres formulate together to create, you know, a new form, a new genre, if you want to call it, but it's it's a combination of different ideas and thought. Um, and Another really important point um, is the inclusion of wisdom songs as part of wisdom literature and the wisdom tradition. Um, Stefan Geller uh, analysis of the wisdom songs is specifically Psalm, I think 119, 119 amongst a few others, um, that these wisdom songs were drawing, were drawn by a group of pietists. Um, and he talks about the merging of old and new wisdom forms 
Um, old wisdom was considered more um, natural wisdom, looking at the world and nature and drawing wisdom. And the new wisdom was connected to the Torah, the, the <clears throat> divine expression in the Torah as the source of wisdom. And those two things were at tension with one another. And in these Psalms, they were actually brought together. Um, and he basically proves it through his, his analysis of those, of those Psalms. And an interesting element in those Psalms is the place of piety. The word chasid, tzaddik, um, which means pious, righteous, uh, plays a very prominent role in these in these psalms. And basically, these are, in my opinion, the beginning of the group of pietists. And obviously, the group is not the same exact group, but in every generation, they kind of draw from similar um, sources, traditions that they connect to and develop the idea of piety. So we'll see that there are pietists Tests, holy men of different kinds throughout the different generations um, from the late biblical period to the second temple era and then up into the rabbinic period. So one of the important points that we'll see is the place, the importance place of prayers um, and psalms that are connected to wisdom and piety um, with connection with Elijah and the wisdom material in, in the rabbinic corpus. So with regards to how wisdom develops into the Second Temple era, a, a important uh, scholar uh, that influenced a lot of the way that I understood the development of wisdom is Cornelius Venema. And he really has, I, I say tripartite division, but he actually has four divisions. I disagree a little bit with his fourth division because he calls it Qum Qumranian wisdom from Qumran that basically incorporates all of these three together. Um, but I think that that's just, um, and it's an expression that is already seen in other texts that will combine apocalyptic with Torah and spirit. It's not only found in Qumran, um, but is developed in the most clear way in Qumran. So I really think that it's really a tripartite division that is later, connect, they connect with one another. Um, so just to explain these three types of wisdom, um, the Torah-centered wisdom views the Torah, the you know five books of Moses, as the um, source of wisdom. And the way to attain wisdom is through what we call inspired exegesis, through study. And when you study the Torah, you're able to access this deeper wisdom. Um, and works such as, you know, Ben Sira um, are an example of Torah-centered wisdom. I think he also says Josephus, for example, holds this perspective. And he actually puts the rabbinic material in this grouping, which is something I disagree with. I actually think that the rabbinic material um, incorporates all of these three kinds of wisdom in their in the work, in their works, in the entire corpus. Um, but he places it like Pirkei Avot, he places it in the Torah-centered wisdom. Um, the second is the apocalyptic-centered wisdom, which views the source of wisdom to be a mediating angel, right? That's, that's how one can, can receive this divine wisdom through uh, some kind of vision or mediating angel. And usually the type of wisdom that is expressed in the apocalyptic centered uh, tradition is esoteric wisdom, uh, wisdom having to do with the creation of the world, the end of days, the messianic era, and also any kind of heavenly secrets or anything that's going up uh, in the heavens. So that, for example, the book of Enoch is an example of this kind of uh, apocalyptic centered wisdom. Um, and the third type of wisdom is the spirit-centered wisdom, um, which views the uh, spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, uh, Numia in Philo's work, this idea of the spirit that one is filled with um, that, that inspires them to, to understand things and see the world and, and have a greater uh, understanding of, of, of whether it's exegesis, whether it's 
um, uh, just uh, their experience in the world, understanding, you know, creation of the world, all these different things is, is through one's experience of, of having the spirit rest upon them. Um, and so those are the three types of wisdom. And basically by utilizing this tripartite division is able to look at all the different Elijah traditions and many times connect it to at least one, if not two or three of these types of wisdom within the text. Um, so the best thing is for, I don't know how, how much I have, I have time. So the best thing is I always say to let the sources uh, speak for themselves. And so uh, I would like to look at a few sources that deal with the different types of Elijah traditions, like the biblical role, messianic role, and legendary role, like the role uh, Elijah plays in, in, in legends and see the wisdom element within them. And hopefully if we still have time, to also look at um, the pietistic element. So I can't really go into all the stories, um, but hopefully we'll get like a little bit of a, of a taste of the depth and really fascinating sources that deal with Elijah. So here, uh, this is actually the sources in the Jerusalem Talmud, um, uh, Berachot, um, I think it's 5D. Um, and here it's, it's this, Tradition is placed in a discussion of how one should recite the um, Shema blessing, the blessing that one says uh, at least two, 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 two times a day. Um, and it describes how a person should um, enter into prayer. Okay, so it says, um, I don't know if there's any preference if I should read the Hebrew or not. Um, it's up to whatever people. I think for the sake of time, it's better uh, to read only the English text and we Perfect. can turn to the um, uh, Hebrew if there are questions of interpretation, but this okay. will be more time to discuss uh, the sources. Excellent. Okay, so we'll just look at the English and we'll kind of read them quickly. So it says, one should not stand to recite the prayer, neither after a conversation, nor after laughter, nor after levity, nor after any trivial matter, but only after words of Torah. So first it discusses prayer, and then it says, similar to prayer, likewise, one should not depart from his friend, neither after conversation, nor after laughter, nor after levity, nor after any trivial matter, but only after words of Torah. Okay, and how do they know this important life advice and information? From the way that Elijah took leave of Elisha, his student, only after speaking words of Torah. So how do they know that Elijah and Elisha were speaking words of Torah? It says that as they still went on and talked. So in Hebrew, very important, the words are haloch v'daber. They were walking and they were talking. And so from these two words, haloch v'daber, specifically the word daber, um, they learn that this is talking about words of Torah. So there's obviously going to be different opinions as to what they were talking about. There's never one opinion in their opinion material. So what were they talking about? So we have the opinion of Rav Achva ben Rav Izera said they were discussing the recitation of the Shema. Um, so that was one opinion. Why? Because in the, in the verses of Shema itself, it says, and you shall talk with Dibar Tabam. So it has the same root of Daber in the two words. Rav Judah ben Pazi says, no, they were discussing the creation of the world. Why? Because in accord with Psalms, which talks about the creation of the world, it says by the word, Bidvar Hashem, right? Shamaim Nivreu, Nasu, that by the, the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. So the parallel of Daber and Daber reflects that they were talking about the creation of the world, the secrets of creation. Rabbi Yudan, son of Rabbi Abayu, said they were discussing the consolation of Jerusalem. So this talks about you know, the Messianic era and the restoration of Jerusalem. As it says, the, the brew, um, here it says, the, um, sorry, the brew alev Yerushalayim, right? Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and the rest of the verses and cry to her that the warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, 
which is received from the Lord to double for all her sins, basically the restoration of Jerusalem and the Jewish people back into Jerusalem. This is from Isaiah. And then the sages say, what were they discussing? They were discussing the description of the Merkava, the chariot, right? One of the most esoteric um, descriptions of, um, in it, found in Ezekiel of God's heavenly throne. Um, and in accord, why? Because it said, and behold, they were walking and talking. Deber, and what was there? What did they see? A chariot of fire and horses of fire, which is what Elijah was um, carried onto, you know, up to heaven. Um, and so here, if we just quickly analyze, it talks about Elijah's character. He's walking with Elisha. And what is he talking about? What is he seen to be conversing about? Um, obviously, all these deep esoteric ideas of wisdom. Um, and it's given in the same discussion that talks about how to depart from a friend, how to talk to people, how to talk uh, before prayer, after prayer, all these different things. So it's part of that wisdom element that then also goes further, not only to like give you this life advice, but also talk about how um, Elijah was connected with all these deep wisdom themes, more of, you could say, apocalyptic wisdom, esoteric wisdom and things like that so you see a double element here um within you know just talking torah the, the laws of shema the laws of the shema prayer versus more deeper ideas so that's just uh one example um the next source is reflects elijah's elijah's uh, messianic role as a bearer of wisdom um this is found in mishnah of eduyot um eight seven so this is a, a tanaitic source um, and here it talks about what does Elijah do when he's expected to return in the Messianic era. So here Rabbi Yeshua says, I have received from Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, who heard from his master and his master from his master, the halacha from Moses at Sinai, that Elijah does not come to declare impure or pure, to push away or to bring close, rather to push away those that were brought close through force, and to bring close those who were pushed away by force. The family of Beit Serafia that lived in the East Jordan was pushed away. Um, and the Bencion family was also pushed away by force. And then another family that's not named, which was there, but the Bencion family brought close. So this is, has to do with um, priestly lineage and Jewish lineage. So it says that basically Elijah at the end of the day will declare who's actually um, of, of the correct lineage um, to perform tasks in, in the temple. Um, so like these families, Elijah comes to declare pure and impure to push away and to bring back. Um, Judah disagrees and says, he's, Elijah's job is to bring close, but not to push away anyone. And Rabbi Shimon says that actually his job is to resolve the controversies, the machlokot, uh, the halachic controversies that have not been resolved. And the rabbis say not to push away, not to bring close, but rather to make peace in the world. And it says, behold, I sent you Elijah the prophet, and he shall return the hearts of the fathers unto the sons and the hearts of the sons unto the fathers. So um, there's many, many things that um, I discussed in the work about this particular source. Um, many parallels to Elijah perhaps being the, 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 the priest uh, um, that is expected at the end of days because he does a lot of priestly things. Elijah as a priest is one of the traditions of his background, but then there's those who say he's not a priest, but rather a prophet or a teacher, the teacher at the end of days. And that's to resolve the controversies is probably the most important part of this um, source in showing that Elijah was seen as a teacher at the end of days who would discuss and resolve controversies um, in the Messianic era. Um, so here we see also, even as his role in this messianic role, we see his role as a teacher, as someone who's giving over um, important halachic Torah knowledge. So that would be more like the Torah-centered expression of Elijah's role as teacher. Um, this third uh, source is uh, an expression of Elijah in rabbinic legends. It shows a combination of Elijah imparting Torah knowledge and esoteric wisdom in one source. 
Um, this is found in Bavli, Talmud Bavli, Berachot 3a. And here it's a interesting story of Rabbi Yose, who was once traveling on the road. And he says, I entered into one of the rooms of Jerusalem in order to pray. Elijah of blessed memory appeared and he waited for me at the door until I finished my prayer. Uh, after I finished my prayer, he said to me, peace be with you, my master. And I replied, peace be with you, my master and teacher. So, yeah, Elijah specifically expressed the teacher. And he said to me, my son, why did you go into this ruin? And I replied to pray. He said to me, you ought to have prayed on the road. I replied, I feared lest passes by might interrupt me. He said to me, you ought to have said an abbreviated prayer. Rav Yose summarizes what he learned from Elijah and he says, thus I then learned from him three things. One must not go into a ruin. One must say that um, the prayer on the road. And if one does say his prayer on the road, he recites an abbreviated prayer. And you'd think that it would end there, but now there's a further conversation. So here I would say like was the Torah-centered wisdom, proverbial, you know, you know, summation of the important knowledge that he learned. And then it goes further. He further said to me, my son, what sound did you hear in this ruin? And I replied, I heard a divine voice cooing like a dove and saying, woe to the children on account of whose sins I destroyed my house and burned my temple and exiled them among the nations of the world. So here it's a, a expression of what's happening in the heavenly sphere. What is God? How does God feel as a result of the destruction of the temple? Um, if you talk about the Odyssey, God's punishment, good people punished, bad people punished, what's, what's the source of punishment? Um, so here he said, so Elijah replies to him, by your life and by your head, not in this moment alone does, it, does this divine heavenly voice excla exclaim so, but three times each day it exclaims it. And more than that, whenever the Jewish people go into the synagogues and schoolhouses and respond, may his great name be blessed, the Holy One, blessed be he, shakes his head and says, Happy is the king who is thus praised in his house. Woe to the father who had to banish his children, and woe to the children who had to be banished from the table of their father. So here we move from a Torah-centered wisdom, imparting halachic advice on what to, how to pray on the road, to more an esoteric um, understanding of what is God exclaiming in the heavens, when people pray and basically what is kind of like the um, correction for um, the destruction of the temple is the prayer at the synagogues, and the schoolhouses. Um, so this is just also another expression of Elijah as a teacher of wisdom. Um, and then uh, this last source is tying Elijah to the spirit center tradition um, through his role as being a conduit for Ruach HaKodesh and the Holy Spirit. Um, and in, 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 this is in Tosefta Sota, a uh, Tanaitic source, 12.5. And there it says, uh, prior to the time when Elijah was hidden away, so basically Elijah never died, he was just hidden away somewhere, um, prophecy was abundant in Israel. For it is written, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord had sent me to Beth El. And what else is written? The disciples of the prophet at Beth El came out, etc. Meaning there were many, 50 men of disciples of the prophets followed and stood by a distance. So there were clearly many, many, many prophets who came and who were around because of um, Elijah's presence. And then when Elijah, so here it's, basically saying that they did not say our master, rather they said your master to teach that they were all his peers and were considered Elijah's equal. All these many, many prophets that existed. And sorry, and it says, and from where do we know that Ruach HaKodesh was expelled from them once Elijah left this world? For it is written, they said to him, your servants have 50 able men with them. Let them go and look for your master. They were looking for Elijah once he, he um, disappeared. And is it possible that the day before the people said, you know, the Lord will take your master today as opposed to our master? So because they were just saying that it was Elisha's master, that they had already lost their ability to prophesy. 
Antichrist. And therefore, this shows us that until Elijah was hidden away, prophecy was abundant. Meaning before he was hidden away, prophecy was abundant. Once Elijah leaves, somehow this sucks up all the um, ability to contain, connect with um, the Holy Spirit. And so this theme is presented um, as Elijah being directly linked and connected to the Holy Spirit. Now, an interesting phenomenon that we see um, between the uh, Mishnaic and the Tanaitic material and the Amoraic material is a movement away from Ruach HaKodesh. Um, the, the sources that talk about the attainment of Ruach HaKodesh, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair in his famous Saints Progress, he basically gives advice on how to attain the Holy Spirit. When that tradition is placed in the Babylonian Talmud, the words Ruach HaKodesh are omitted from the text. Um, and um, there are some opinions that basically the, 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 the more that the Holy Spirit had a stronger presence in Christian theology, the more movement away um, from the term Ruach HaKodesh and even it being a, a possible, something possibly to attain um, occurred. But what we do see, interestingly enough, is an increase in the um, revelations of Elijah to rabbinic figures and his presence in rabbinic sources. Um, so it seems, at least from how I see it, that Elijah serves as the replacement for uh, Ruach HaKodesh as the conduit through which one can achieve divine wisdom. Um, and so I don't know if we're out of time, um, but um, basically the, between the, the connection to wisdom and pietists in the wisdom Psalms, to the connection of Elijah and the presence of Ruach HaKodesh, in the saint's progress, he's connected also with the resurrection of the dead through Elijah. He, it, Elijah is connected to of Pinchas ben Yair's statement of achieving Ruach HaKodesh. Um, and he was an example of a pietistic figure. All the stories that surround Pinchas ben Yair is that he was a miracle worker, it's a very pious person. Um, and so we continue to see in the Amoraic material that the Hasid and holy man is portrayed in the image of Elijah and Elisha. And furthermore, Elijah himself appears as the quintessential Hasid. He's connected with prayer, rainmaking, a healer, a miracle worker. He's zealous for the law and he's constantly teaching and appearing to many pietists. Um, so just some conclusions. The Elijah traditions are a great avenue through which we can observe how the different types of the wisdom tradition are present in the rabbinic material. The rabbinic material has expressions of the Torah-centered wisdom, apocalyptic-centered, and spirit-centered wisdom traditions. Contrary to Binama's categories, categorization of the rabbinic material as being only part of the nomistic, which is law, Torah-centered wisdom tradition. And secondly, Elijah the prophet, through his role as a conduit for Ruach HaKodesh and his return in the end of days as a messianic teacher, he was viewed overall in the rabbinic material as a bearer of wisdom that replaced the loss of Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, the strong correlation between Elijah and the pietist wisdom tradition that he revealed, the wisdom that he reveals to the pietists themselves points to, in my opinion, the pietist central role in imparting these wisdom materials and uh, traditions and incorporating them into the rabbinic corpus. Um, so hopefully, that was a little clear as to the overall um, ideas that are expressed in my in my work. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very clear presentation, very informative. You have given us a very good um, overview of your uh, research. And uh, I also like the um, uh, discussion of the selected uh, sources. We have some time for discussion and we already have um, three or four uh, questions. I will read them uh, through chat. The first question is by uh, Sabine Schmidtke. Um, Elijah figures prominently in the Quran. 
Can you possibly talk about the image of Elijah in Muslim wisdom literature or in Muslim literature more generally, perhaps in the Israeli Yat? Uh, she also has a second related question, but I will let you first answer the first one and then we can move to the next one. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have enough knowledge about um, the Quran. And the same thing goes for Christianity and its very prominent place of Elijah in, um, you know, the, the Gospels and other, you know, uh, theological works. And um, I definitely think that there's so, there's a ton, there's so much um, information and, and potential there for, for research um, in, in connecting the, the role of Elijah as a bear of wisdom in, in I think, all the monotheistic religions. Um, I just don't, myself, I'm not qualified um, in those, in those um, subject matters. I wish I was more, maybe in the future. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, I know, a lot of um, material. I think also even in, in later um, mystical, Jewish mystical traditions, Elijah plays a prominent role in the um, bringing down this esoteric mystical wisdom to them as well. Uh, the same question was also related, and I assume that uh, the same answer applies, that it is beyond your expertise, is uh, whether you can say something about the relationship between wisdom literature in Judaism during the period you studied and Islam, whether and how the former influenced the uh, latter. Yeah, I, do, I, I unfortunately don't know enough. I would love to read um, more about it and, you know, expand on it. But um, some of the things, the, the comparative material that I do uh, touch upon is the, um, the Greek um, and Roman um, circles of sages and holy men. And they also had, not Elijah, but they had um, connections to um, different figures. Um, I can't remember exactly the specific God um, in uh, Kristen Lindbeck. She talks about it in, in great detail um, that, that different wisdom sage circles had figures that they would, would, would connect to as the source of their of their wisdom. Yeah, um, this, uh, Pythagoras, for instance, in yes. the uh, Pythagorean tradition, it is the case with Apollonius of Tiana, who is another holy man, uh, yes. referred to, um, uh, and uh, also biographies uh, are written. And so this is really a comparable uh, material. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I think it's very interesting that we have this phenomenon that exists in, in all um, circle, uh, not all, but at least it's the, not the ones that we've noticed here, um, it, it, that these sages um, that saw themselves as bearers of wisdom and of, of really immersing themselves in this wisdom had some kind of figure, um, a divine figure, some, some mediator between the, the, the heavenly world and the earthly world that could impart that wisdom to them. Uh, Sabine also has a third question, but before we go to there, I'll read the question by David Charney. Isn't there a view of a Lajaya as being removed from the scene for lacking the wisdom to cope with his situation and therefore being destined to play the role he should have played initially? Is this ambivalence reflected in rabbinic uptake of Elijah? Yes. Um, there's actually a very interesting source in the Mechilta, which is an early Tanaitic um, commentary midrash on the book of um, Exodus. And there it says, it's actually quite um, critical of Elijah, and it says that he was the one who had um, fought for the honor of the father, but not for the honor of the sons, which means he was too zealous for God, and as a result, in his extreme zealousness, was willing to um, destroy, and, you know, create famine and all these different things that he brought upon other Jewish people to try to um, 
encourage them not to uh, be idol worshippers. And this was seen as as a failure on his part. Um, and in many ways, uh, it seems that the rabbinic um, expression of, of Elijah is, is to correct to correct that extreme zealousness. And what's interesting, something that I trace through um, the material on Pietists, is that actually the original Pietists were seen to have been actually quite zealous and even fought battles um, to kill those, for example, during the Maccabean revolt. Um, you know, there was described in Josephus as a group of Hasidim, right, the Hasidim. And there's a whole debate, what's the connection between these pietists and other pietists that we hear about in the Mishnaic material? Is there any connection? I have that whole discussion in my book. But I think even within the pietists who connected themselves to Elijah, there was a transformation between a zealousness to a more, I think, um, moderated view of what we assume piety is now, which is like forgiving and having this, you know, kindness. Um, but um, but I think there's actually even within the sources, and pietists themselves and sages themselves, there was transformation of what do you do when you care so much about the law and the right thing to do? Um, do you destroy everything in your path? There's many rabbinic sources that also stories that talk about this tension between piety to the law and you know living in this world and dealing with people. What what's the correct wisdom path in that in that tension? Thank you. <laughs> Other question of again, I don't know if you can uh, answer this uh, is uh, about the role that Elijah plays, if any, in the Karite literature. Oh. Um, I don't know. Um, I studied Karite history briefly in my undergrad um, studies at Bar Ilan, but I have not looked into. I'm sure that there's something there. I, I can't imagine that there 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 must be, um, but I don't know. I, I don't have a, a clear sense of the Karite material. I have a. Um... Out of ignorance, uh, since uh, I'm an ancient historian not working on rabbinic uh, sources, although I do know something about uh, Jews and I have studied the Jewish community in Aphrodisias in the imperial period, uh, I noticed that occasionally there is some, uh, but not a lot, uh, reference to some form of emotional control. Uh, the first source that you presented was about controlling passion. Then we heard something about not uh, praying after laughter. Uh, is there uh, anything of the sort in the um, uh, presentation of um, uh, this uh, figure of authority? Or is emotion something that doesn't play the part that um, uh, such authoritative figures play in the Greek literature? where, for instance, they are figures that uh, teach about anger and indignation, about the fear of God, about love, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, that is an interesting uh, point that I do think is, is part of the wisdom tradition, is how to channel correctly emotions, um, you know, using your, your, your intellect, <laughs> be able to, to to balance you know the the passions that we have with our emotions and where they where they drive us I would say that it's very very interesting a part that I didn't really touch upon in my presentation is one of the um, important um, things that uh, the wisdom tradition tries to kind of control also is the um, uh, physical desires uh, passion for you know sexuality and kind of containing it in in a, in a positive way. Um, you have woman wisdom, right? Wisdom is expressed as a woman, whether it's because that's mysterious, um, and so it reflects that idea. Um, but also in in the correct way of dealing with the the physical, you know, sexual passions that that people have. So there, there's definitely a lot there. There's a lot of stories that Elijah uh, does discuss um, the balance and the, and even in a halachic framework of uh, incorporating that in our lives. So I definitely think that that, the, that idea of emotions and passions and controlling them is, is something that 
that is part of the wisdom tradition does have a, a significant presence in the sources. Thank you. Um, I do not see any further questions. Uh, can I, I ask a question? Sure. Or a comment, maybe. Uh, so it was very intriguing, you mentioning the uh, Ruhad Kodesh uh, uh, and it figures a lot, as you said, in uh, in Christian literature, in particular in Syriac, which is kind of um, in contact, more in contact, let's say, with the Jewish tradition and with the uh, rabbinic tradition. And it's interesting that you mentioned that later on the Jewish tradition starts to move away from it because it has this Christian connotation. So I'm just wondering how much of that uh, is due not just to context with Christians, but in particular context with Syria Christianity, because, because the term is exactly the same. It, it is, it is Ruhat Qudsha or Ruh, Ruh Qudsha. Uh, so it, it's exactly the same Aramaic term used both in Judaism and in Syria Christianity. And I don't know if you know if anybody looked into this. Um, I, I do think that there, the, um, also the, I think in, in the Syriac Christian tradition, there were significant holy men within, within those circles as well. And, and I think the influence and the, this, the borrowing or the cultural, you know, back and forth mm -hmm. between these two communities, I definitely, I think Boyarin, Daniel Boyarin is des describes the the parting of the ways being much 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 later than we realize, and that there's actually a lot of discussion, conversation that happens uh, in between the lines mm -hmm. uh, within these sources and how they do influence one another. Um, I would I would be interested also. I think it's it's more dramatic shift in the later sources than in the earlier sources. Um, I think to compare also the the what they call the Jerusalem Talmud, which was just written in 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 you know, or the Palestinian Talmud as mm -hmm. they call it, in, in Israel during the Roman uh, <laughs> period, the of late antiquity, and then the Babylonian Talmud, which was developed even further, seems to move even more further away from it, even though they were farther away from those sources. Mm. So very interesting. Um, who knew what, where, when, and how? It's very interesting, uh, but it's it seems clear to me that that it was such a prominent thing in you know um, Jewish tradition that it it's almost it's very noticeable that it kind of doesn't appear as much um, in the later sources. Um, but we do have actually I think a return to it in 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 some later midrashim that goes more towards the medieval period of kind of kind of trying to reclaim reclaim ruach hakodesh. Yeah. Um, in that way, it could be that actually maybe with moving away from the Syriac, and if you have, you know, Latin, it maybe doesn't sound the same, so then you can reclaim it as your own because you're not fighting mm -hmm. a similar, exactly same, you know, sounding uh, word with very different, you know, meanings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not very, very different, but yeah. slightly different to be significant. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much. So um, now I do not see any further questions. Uh, if there are any, uh, this is the last chance. <laughs> but this doesn't seem to be the case. I, I'm sure that I speak in the name of everyone who attended your talk, that this was very informative and uh, interesting and has uh, given us uh, both uh, knowledge, but also uh, food for thought. Uh, and uh, congratulations for your publication. And I hope that um, uh, you will continue your uh, research in the future. And Thank you so much. I also received a lot of insight from all your questions and ideas for further research. Yeah. And on the last slide, you have the information about uh, the book that was uh, published and also the information about uh, how one can uh, acquire it uh, with a 40% um, uh, discount. So thank you again. Thank you uh, everyone for attending this uh, talk and then uh, I can only wish you happy holidays and a new year that uh, <laughs> will not be as bad as 2022. <laughs>
Yes, and just to add to that, <laughs> just a few few words from the Gorgias, and this is a perfect uh, season finale to to um, uh, our talks. We're going to take a break in the fall, uh, but we will get back to you, and we will announce the the uh, the next series uh, uh, or, the, or the next season. Sorry, we'll, we'll announce the next season probably in the spring. And thanks, of course, to, to Zabine, Angelos, Maria uh, at, um, uh, sorry, at IAS for this collaboration between IAS and, and Gorgias. Uh, it, it, it was a perfect season. I agree. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye then, everybody.